Welcome to today's webinar, Technician Training Basics for Better Business Habits, brought to you by Pest Management Professional and by our sponsor, Control Solutions. I'm Diane Safranek from North Coast Media, publisher of Pest Management Professional Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available one day from today on our website, mypmp.net slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be emailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice in the lower left-hand corner of your console that there is a submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click submit to place your question in queue. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of PMP Magazine or in one of our biweekly e-newsletters, The Buzz. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Allison Barwaltz or I will personally assist you. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, PMP Managing Editor, Will Nepper. Hi everyone, this is Will Nepper. As Diane said, I'm Managing Editor of Pest Management Professional, and we're very excited to once again have Marie Knox, Technical Services Manager for Control Solutions Incorporated, uh, hosting a webinar for us. Uh, we will be taking questions after Marie's presentation, so uh, stay on after that, and we'll get your questions answered. And without uh, well, one thing, since it is the 13th anniversary of September 11th, in honor of those who served for us and the veterans who served for us in the past, we'd just like to thank you for protecting us and honor those we lost 13 years ago today. We thought it was important to get to that before moving forward and recognize uh, the special day. So without further ado, I will turn this over to Marie. And Marie, uh, you can tell us a little bit about training. Thank you so much, Will, and thank you for mentioning September 11th. Absolutely. It's very important that we never forget and we continue to honor all of those who keep us free and protect our freedom. So today what we are going to talk about is technician training, and today's title is Basics for Better Business Habits. Because we'll branch out a bit beyond just technician training to talk about management and sales as well today. Some of the topics that we're going to cover today include a recap from tech training Bad Habits Die Hard, which um, took place last year, and it is currently available on YouTube through the mypmp.net slash webinars link. You can then scroll down and follow the YouTube link. But it's not necessary to have already viewed or attended this past webinar. In fact, we'll touch on a lot of the topics that I um, received a lot of questions and messages uh, concerning um, or about after that last webinar. So we're going to have a simple review of how people learn. We'll touch back on the tips and the tricks that you can incorporate into your current training program or um, to help you get started in putting together your standard operating procedures and your technician training programs if you don't have them in place yet. And then we'll also recap some of the free help. I like free. I like affordable, but I really like free. So free help available to get you started if you don't have standard operating procedures or formalized training programs in place. We'll also cover some discussion on customer retention as it relates to technician and sales staff personalities, their follow through, as well as attitude. And then we'll, <clears throat> we'll also have some discussion near the end and throughout the presentation surrounding some of the questions that came in during the registration process for this webinar, including what happens when you lose customers shortly after that initial treatment? You know, you took care of their problem, uh, the urgency is gone, and they cancel their service. We'll also refer to a question that came in about bad habits being passed from the more seasoned technicians to the newer hires and how to stop it. 
or at least how to get a handle on it, first by recognizing it, um, and then some steps to remedy it. And also, um, a neat question came in, which is a, a little bit off of today's topic, but it relates more to my um, social media marketing for business series with um, mypmp.net. And it's about getting technicians and sales staff on board with collecting or helping you as an owner, as a manager, or a marketer in the business produce content for marketing use, um, like for social media, for blog posts, and even for your training manuals. Remember, um, pictures speak a thousand words, so photos from the field can oftentimes be incorporated into your training manuals and they make the training experience much more enjoyable and valuable and effective, especially for your new hires. Then we will wrap the presentation and cover questions from the audience. So in general, over the last 15 or, year, or so years, I've been able to participate in training technicians, managers, sales teams for companies of all sizes, from the one-man operator just starting out to companies with national footprints and every size in between. But one of the most profound realizations that I've had is that regardless of size, all companies need solid new hire and effective continuing training programs in place to ensure their continued growth and success over time. And I'm going to try to keep us on on point today and not go over my allotted amount of time, but training happens to be my favorite topic and um, probably the most favorite part of my career thus far. So um, I do tend to get a little long-winded, but feel free to give me any of your training questions at the end. So a few questions for the audience. Do you have a training program in place for a newly hired technician? Do you have standard operating procedures? Um, we'll refer to them as SOPs from here on out for the different facets of your business, whether you participate in indoor general pest control, perimeter pest um, management. You, know, you could have standard operating procedures that relate to inspection and application for both of these categories, including uh, termite inspection and treatment and lawn care inspection and application. Standard operating procedures um, can start out very broad, and then you can whittle them down or funnel them down to the finer points within each category. So if the answer is yes, you have all of this in place, that is awesome. But it doesn't mean that you can hang up right now and log off the computer, because I guarantee you're going to get some, some new information today. If the answer is no, you don't have any of this in place, please do not worry. Do not think that you are behind. We will get you started today building your programs by the end of this presentation. So SOPs can be as complex or as simple as you want to make them. A few parts that they need to have um, they need to touch on the how, who, what, when, where, and why. So as examples, your standard operating procedures need to answer these questions, like how. How do you inspect? How do you make applications? Who? You might refer to chain of command. Um, maybe if you're talking about for your CSRs, who handles issues? Um, who's first in line for customer complaints and how do they get handled. Then they also need to touch on the what, what pests. It could be, if you're talking termite, what types of structures. Also, what products might be used. What's on your approved product list for the specific issues that you deal with. And then the when. When to treat and when not to treat. There are times, believe it or not, where we don't need to actually treat, but where it's more of uh, remedying a conducive condition or having a discussion with a homeowner about clutter or trash or sanitation. Um, and then that can also take place in conjunction with treatment. But the when is very important. If you happen to be in the lawn care realm, you know, you might, or in ornamentals, you might also want to know when certain diseases are active 
in turf grass or with ornamentals. You know, there are winter diseases and summer diseases. Same thing goes for weeds and for specific pest species. You know, there's a stink bug season, <clears throat> excuse me, up in the northeast, just like we have varying termite seasons throughout the country. And then finally, the why. I'm sure you, a lot of you have kids. Um, they'll ask you why, why, why. Well, your technicians, your salespeople, your CSRs, your owners, your managers, everybody also has that same question of why. Why do you do any of the above? And when you provide an answer on why you do it the way you do it, um, it helps other people to get on board. So offering the why as part of your standard operating procedures um, is also a very important part because it will help eventually in conversations with homeowners um, or commercial customers uh, if certain questions come up. Another thing that you might want to include would be providing drawings or even photos in these standard operating procedures right there in the manual, whether you have an old school paper manual like I like or a digital file, you know, maybe you've created an ebook for yourself, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves right now and too fancy. I still like to stick with the standard paper manuals. Um, providing drawings and photos helps technicians or whomever you're training know where your company applies certain products and why, as well as it can point out areas to inspect. So if you have an SOP that's just about inspecting in kitchens, it's great to have visuals to accompany all of the words that will be in an SOP. And having SOPs established and written down may even help reduce your liability later on. Now this is a very big deal, especially the owners and managers on the line. If ever you had a question or an issue or a complaint, being able to show that yes, you truly have standard operating procedures, protocols in place, on how to handle certain pest uh, applications um, or whatever it is that you've written the SOP for, it can reduce your liability later on. It's always better to be able to say, yes, we have a process in place for that, or this is how we treat, this is not how we treat, um, should that question ever come up in the future. I like everyone to stay legal. So when we're done today, if you don't already have an SOP or training manual in place, you should at least have an idea of what is available to you and how you may want to tackle putting it together. If you do already have a system for training in place and it's in writing, you might just walk away with some new ideas and some new material to freshen up your current program. A big message I want you, everybody to take away today is that Standard operating procedures and training manuals are always works in progress. They are living documents. Um, products change, equipment changes, obviously people change. And so just know that you might create a program this year, and in a year or two you might be going back to the drawing board and, and making some changes to that program, and that's okay. That's okay. So let's get started taking a look at training and what it might look like for you or for me, um, you know, for a large company, for a smaller company. It may not look or feel the same for a company with one to five techs as it may for one with, say, 50 or more technicians or 500 technicians. But what is important to realize is that the same general concepts exist and need to be addressed. Training does not need to be fancy or expensive. There are many resources available to you that are simple and much of the time free. The big investment that any company, any owner, any manager, anybody tasked with creating the programs, um, the biggest investment you need to recognize is time. And you need time to devote to some regular training meetings at your company or training exercises, and we'll get into what that might look like, and some time to create the simple organized training plan for the new hires and for the long-term employees. So let's touch on, before we get into what the training programs will look like, or what they could look like, let's talk about how people learn, because we all have to recognize this. 
Um, we can kind of feel like this is a train the trainer program. Some people can read a paragraph, a paragraph and take a quiz just straight from words and get an A, no problem. Others need, they're a little more visual. They need to see the job or the task being performed in addition to that reading in order to score well, if you will, on the quiz. So for me, I'm a little bit of both. Um, and over the years, I've worked with many PMPs and the most successful training programs I've witnessed are the ones that include both aspects. Classroom aspects with some reading, with some quizzing, and also hands-on, very visual, very tactile, actually making applications and practicing, practicing um, inspection techniques and anything in the field. So a good mix of both I have found to be very important. Now, in addition, since everybody learns differently, training programs should actually be varied enough to include some or all of the following or even other ideas. So a good training program will have some aspects of hands-on in the field training, and that's not just ride-alongs with you know, older technicians or seasoned technicians. It should include some online or some video modules. Now, I'm not saying that you guys need to go out there and start creating your own videos um, and get you know, super tech, techie on me. So I'll show you where you can find some cool free stuff online that you can incorporate into your training. Some reading and some quizzes. And whenever I mention quizzes or tests, people usually you know, they bristle up a little bit. But I like fun quizzes, and I also like to encourage people uh, with prizes, and, and they can be you know, minor little $5 Starbucks gift cards or, you know, or you could get wild and do a $20 gas gift card if you want. But reading with quizzes and some fun prizes um, is always interesting. And for your training meetings, it helps to keep people engaged. Varying the speakers. So if you have training meetings as part of your program, Varying the speakers or the presenters, if possible, is also another great way to keep people engaged. I can't tell you how many times um, I've gone in for live training with companies, and I get finished with my program, and it could be on, let's just say, biology of ants or ticks or fleas, whatever, and their treatment. And when I'm done, the technicians are happy, the sales manager is happy, and usually um, the trainer or the sales manager, whoever generally leads those type of training meetings, either weekly or monthly at the offices, they usually say, you know, you said every, almost everything that I say in a meeting to the guys and gals, but they, they actually listened to you. And so I've learned over time, it's not necessarily me, it's just when they hear something from a different person, and sometimes from somebody outside the company, it can click because different people say things in different ways. So even if you're delivering the same information, it's good to mix it up and vary the speakers and the presenters if possible. Another option or another idea is to give each technician um, or even salesperson or, or CSR, get everybody involved in the company, an insect or a topic to research. Now, I'm not talking, you know, hours and hours of research. I'm talking like five, ten minutes Google research. And then at each training meeting, they could present maybe for ten minutes to the group what they learned, and they can share. Now, an example would be, say you have 12 technicians and you hold monthly meetings. That would only be one ten-minute presentation for each technician in a year which, believe me, is very doable. And I'll, I'll get into uh, where you could get the material for that in a little bit. And then, you know, any other ideas or suggestions that you guys might have, you could get suggestions from within your company or from outside of your company. Um, it's just good to have a very uh, varied training program that's not just, you know, a book and a ride-along. So why is training important? Why are we even doing this? Well, whether you've been on the job 20 years or 20 minutes, you need training in whatever industry you're in. That's my opinion, and I, I think it holds true. It's human nature.
to try to make our jobs easier or go faster. That's not always a bad thing. But much of the time, that involves creating shortcuts that over time may end up hurting our level of service, and they might lower our productivity and then our profitability. That's where the problems come in. So regular continued training for all of us helps to bring us all back to the basics so we are less likely to reinforce any developing bad habits. And as a side note, regular training and keeping up with even those most seasoned, seasoned technicians can help you keep a handle on matching up what is happening in the field with what you originally intended in the training programs, if that makes sense. Because over time, if you kind of let everybody just uh, train themselves, if you will, then you might think a treatment is being done a certain way in the field when in reality it's not at all. And maybe that might reveal why you're having callbacks or cancellations or complaints. So what does training actually look like? I sent out some time ago a survey to companies of all sizes across the country asking them if, so number one, if they have formal technician training programs in place, and if so, how do they train, and what do they include as training materials or methods and content. So we're going to take a quick look at some of the questions, and we'll discuss the findings, and we'll get into a lot of tips and tricks that you can add to your own training arsenal in this part. So the first survey question was, how many technicians does your company have? I always ask, I ask general questions in my surveys before I whittle it down to what I actually want to talk about. I just wanted to see the spread. I wanted to see if we had basically all the major segments of the industry well represented, and I believe we did in this survey. So we had anywhere from a company with less than five technicians all the way up to companies with national footprints. The second question was, how many times per month do you provide some type of technician training? And I listed classroom, invited representative, a biology, hands-on types of training like drawing graphs and doing some math to determine area, et cetera. And the overwhelming answer was once per month. Now, there were some companies who don't train at all, some companies that train every other month, um, a pretty good number trained on a weekly basis, and about the same number trained every other week. But the overall, overwhelming answer was once per month. And for me, once per month seemed to jive with my experience so far. I've worked with companies that run the gamut, um, and I've even done some weekly stints for companies. But for the most part, monthly training meetings um, seem to be the norm across the board if you do training. And I think once per month gives you the opportunity to touch base with everyone, check in with them, see what might be going well or not so well, and also it gives you an opportunity to root out any bad habits you may see developing. You can also take that time to discuss maybe some consistent issues that keep repeating themselves. Um, because if something keeps happening over and over again, we need to change what we're doing, and maybe it starts with training. You can also take a moment to reward the good habits on a regular basis, and that could also become part of your training meetings. Again, going back to some simple little reward, doesn't have to be fancy. Everybody loves seeing their name you know, at the top of a list, uh, winning something. Maybe you could have a contest or maybe, you know, if you have those dry erase boards. I walk into a lot of companies and they have gigantic dry erase boards tracking production and tracking sales and cancellations, um, callback percentages. And maybe, you know, you could take the top person, you know, on the positive side of each category and reward that with either some sort of recognition on a monthly basis um, or even a small gift. Just so everyone knows, I really like recognition, and I'm currently number one 
along with my husband, we're in a couples fantasy football league, but mm-hmm. currently in the top spot. So a little bit of bragging today. Um, I just want you all to know that everybody likes to see their name in that top spot. So you can, uh, going back to training, you can train more or less than once a month. It's totally up to you and what works for your company. That's another big take home. Don't feel like you have to compare yourself to any other company or compare your company to another company. Do what feels right for your company. If every week feels right, that's great. If every other week feels good, that's great. And if once a month is what you can do, that's great too. Just make sure that you're really starting to focus on it. So the third survey question was, what type of technician training does your organization offer? And there were several listed. Now, overwhelmingly, 100% uh, ride-alongs with more seasoned technicians. And then somewhere around 76% was in-house regular scheduled trainings. There's occasional in-house training, hands-on in-house training. Insect biology is is another category that was checked. Um, um, nearly 80% for both label review training, which I think is wonderful. I, wanna, I would love to see more label review training happening, as well as invited distributor or manufacturer rep training. And those usually focus on products only. Some, some of them come in and do, and do biology. So I've, I've always added some biology uh, personally and some business, as, business training aspects. Um, but it's really great. The label review training and inviting in distributor and manufacturer reps really go hand in hand because if anybody should know their labels, um, you know, it's the distributor and the manufacturer reps selling those products. So th- they are phenomenal resources for uh, especially label review training so you can keep current on what's going on out there. Now, there was a section on the previous slide that noted other. And I allowed people to write in what that other was for them. And I thought these were really great answers. So I'll share with you some other types of training that you could cover in your meetings. Defensive driver training. CEU presentations. If you belong to your state association, um, I know some states have a couple different associations in them, but if you if you uh, belong to it and they have regular region meetings where they have CEU um, CEU programs, that's a great time to take a few technicians if you can with you or your CSRs, your office staff, um, just to kind of broaden their training experience. I think this next one is supposed to read PPE and core, so personal protective equipment and core. That's another great topic to cover on your own in your own internal meetings. Safety goes hand in hand with that. And then reviewing, um, in this case it says review of IFAS, that's the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences here at the University of Florida, reviewing those documents. Um, Again, I'll I'll get into the, the free stuff in a second, and this is part of it. And then this company actually responded and said, we also allow tax to present a past and a training topic to control the past. Well, I think that's great because you really get people involved and engaged and interested. And, and again, you're varying the meetings, you're varying the topics, you're varying the content so people stay interested. So let's jump back one second. The top answer from that previous question was having new techs ride along with the more seasoned technicians. This is very important. And uh, for many states, it's required. It's on the job training. It's part of the deal of you know, getting to your ID card. So while it's very important and it should be continued, in my opinion, we need to be aware that some bad habits or shortcuts could be passed on with each generation, if you will, of technician in your company. And over time, what is happening in the field may not necessarily match what you originally intended. That can also happen when you don't train, and somebody just kind of makes it up as they go along. So how do we counteract this passing of the bad habit torch? Well, we train train and we retrain, especially when we think we know it all or have seen it all. We train. 
sometimes it just takes thinking about what we do in a different way for things to actually click. And I know for me, I seek training even outside of our industry um, because it's very important to realize that none of us are perfect and we can always get better, be better, and learn something new. And a lot of times when you learn stuff in, in other industries, or in another way, uh, in another facet, it can really apply to your current career and it can kind of come over, bridge over and provide you greater insight into what you're already doing and make you better at what you're doing for your career. So as an example of how sometimes, you know, we need to be reminded of things in a different manner, I like to use analogies. So when I train on lawn rig calibration, for example, and this can go for calibrating any piece of equipment, but I, I've spent a lot, a lot of time with uh, turf and ornamentals as well. But when I train on lawn rig calibration, I like to use this analogy of comparing the lawn rigs to racehorses. I usually say, think about it. You don't change the horse for the jockey. You fit the jockey to the horse. And this same goes for your lawn rigs. First, you figure out the flow rate of your rig, and then you use that information to train that technician how much volume they're putting out over a certain area during a period of time. All of the lawn trucks, like if you happen to be a lawn company and I'm talking to you, all of your lawn trucks will put out five gallons of water in a different amount of time. And you can use the bucket test, and we're not going to get into that exactly today. You can email me afterwards if you want to know what that is. but. They'll all put out five gallons of water in different amounts of time. You can't expect them all to be the same. It's equipment. You can try really hard to calibrate them to be really close, but they're not going to be exact. Um, but what you can do is to make sure that each tech knows the information for their individual trucks. So if truck A puts out five gallons in one minute, then they then you know or your technician knows if your volume over say 1,000 square feet, your desired volume is five gallons of finished dilution, then they better be walking that 1,000 square feet in a one minute time period to be putting out that five gallons. So while we're on the subject of calibration, here are some nifty exercises you can do either as a technician or as a trainer. I know we've got managers and owners and trainers and everybody on this call today. So here's what you can do to increase everyone's success and profitability. And we'll see some pictures coming up, so it's not just words today. You can see what a 1,000 square feet actually looks like. You can use your measuring wheel and mark out the area with stakes or cones. And then you can practice walking this area at each person's normal pace and time it or let them count their paces. It's very important to let your technicians and your salespeople get a feel for what a 1,000 square feet looks like. And it doesn't just apply to lawn care. It definitely applies to, um, to PCO, to general pest control, general household pest, however you refer to it. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. But let everyone get a feel for what this size of area looks like. Um, you can compare it to something memorable, like it looks like six parking lots or one-third of a tennis court. Now, where did I get those crazy comparisons? Well, I actually went over to the parking lot near a local tennis court and uh, marked out 1,000 square feet. And it's roughly six standard parking spaces, at least in this photo. In this photo, I used um, just the grass ball fields, and I marked out 1,000 square feet. And you could go ahead and let everyone take a spin around it with their normal spreader if you happen to be a lawn company. Obviously, no product in it, but just to get a feel for what that 1,000 square feet feels like and looks like. I guarantee you, if you ask people to put cones out in an area, don't give them a measuring wheel. Just ask them to put cones out on what they think 1,000 square feet looks like. No one's going to get it right or very, I should say, very few people will get it right. I didn't get it right. I'm still off when I try it. So just another look. And if anybody wants these pictures, I'm, you know, I took them. Uh, I'll feel free to share them. So just email me after the presentation, and I'll, I'll send them on over to you. But um, 
this is just a simple drawing, 50 feet by 20 feet. That's how I set it up. There's the handy measuring wheel. It's also a good idea to take a look at what rate for maybe your favorite granular products actually look like. I know some granular products say two capfuls as one of their rates. Now, two capfuls to one person might mean two heaping capfuls, while to someone else it might be two level capfuls and so on. Um, uh, example from my house is uh, my husband accuses me of making our dogs fat, and that's because for me, the idea of the scoop is a heaping scoop, and for him, the idea of the scoop is a bit more proper as a level scoop. So usually if I'm not on the road and I'm working from my office locally, um, my dogs tend to get a bit chubby because I'll be the one feeding them the most. So aside from that, take pictures of what these amounts look like. So if something calls for two capfuls, um, take pictures of what that measurement actually looks like and then add that picture to your new technician training manual alongside of, hey, maybe even that label. Remember, we all learn a little differently from one another, so pairing a picture with an amount might help the person learning to make a stronger connection. So I know this might sound elementary, but it's always a good refresher so you're not putting too much or too little product out and wondering either why you're spending a ton of money on products or worse, your callbacks or your cancellations could be skyrocketing. Now I did allude to this. Did you know that a thousand square feet also goes for general household pest or general pest control applications as well? Think about it. If you're applying a certain product in, say, a 10-foot band, maybe it's three feet up and seven feet out from the foundation wall of the structure, around a 200 linear foot home, you're actually applying product to, a, to 2,000 square feet. That's an area of 2,000 square feet. So if you're working with a product that the, the label calls for one ounce of product in one gallon of water per 1,000 square feet, then to actually do the proper treatment at that structure, you'd be putting two ounces of product in two gallons of water for that example. So these are things that we really need to introduce um, and help technicians get their head around. Even think about lawn applications. And I, I'm not going to get too heavy into math, so don't worry, although it, that's another one of my favorite topics to train on. If you think about lawn applications, uh, that call for one ounce of product or concentrate per thousand square feet in four gallons of water, now we start throwing volume in, in here, then you're treating, like say you're going to treat a 5,000 square foot lawn, you're going to need, because there's 5,000 square feet, if it's one ounce per thousand, you're going to need five ounces of product. And if you want to put out four gallons of water per thousand square feet, you're going to need 20 gallons of water for that lawn, for that 5,000 square foot lawn. So this is where we really need to review our labels and double check the flow output of the rigs or backpacks and B&Gs. Doesn't matter what segment you're treating in, rates are very, very important and kind of double checking and retraining on some simple math is also going to help us. And doing it on a regular basis is very important. So let's, let's start building some training programs. We have some tips and tricks. We, we mentioned some ideas on how to get people engaged in your training. But now let's, let's actually build a training program uh, and see what it looks like. So it's truly not rocket science. I say that a lot. It's not rocket science to put together a sound, well-rounded training program for your company that not – only trains your new folks, but also your seasoned professionals. It can take a little time and effort. That's really the, the big investment. However, I know this is where many companies get stuck. We call it analysis paralysis. You just keep, you overthink it over and over again. And really, you just need to dive in because you don't want to be paralyzed by overthinking it. But taking the time and just jumping in, starting with something. It doesn't have to be perfect or pretty. 
Getting something down on paper is better than nothing, and it will pay off. Getting consistency in your inspections and your treatments, this is really the big bonus of having good training programs and regular training, is to get consistency in inspections, consistency in treatments, and having consistency across all of your technicians, whether they're brand new or they've been with you for 20 years. It will allow you to pinpoint issues faster and eventually will help you better manage your materials, use, and cost. And that is a very big deal. Now, setting aside a day a week or a day a month. Now, I'm, right now I'm talking to the people who are going to set up the training program. Set aside some time, whatever works for you. Heck, it could be one hour a week. It could be, you know, one day a month. To work on it is going to be a very small, manageable time investment to create a great program. So again, remember, your training program is not set in stone. And the materials can and will change, and they'll vary depending on a lot of scenarios. So don't feel like your program has to be perfect before you roll it out. It is going to be a work in progress. Encourage a few of your technicians to look over what you're putting together um, and better yet, make them part of the process as you refine or tweak your programs. Having other people involved and their input is going to be helpful. And that may even be how you start. You might you know, sit down with a couple of your technicians and your, your manager or, your, or it's just you yourself just writing out, okay, what do I do on a new start? Just write down what you do. That's really how it starts is just writing down the steps. Or say you've got 5, 10, 12 technicians, um, you know, ask them all, what are, we, what are we supposed to be doing at each call? If I'm going to go into a kitchen and inspect, what are the steps that I'm going to take to inspect? That's literally how the program is created. It sounds very simple, um, but that's, that's really all it is, is just writing down the steps. So simple is best. And inexpensive is even better. So not only should it be relatively easy to organize, but putting these things together, these training programs, it should not cost an arm and a leg. Many training tools are available now that are free. Yes, free. I'm going to point you in the direction now of where to find the freebies out there. Okay, YouTube videos. Even earlier in the presentation, I mentioned that my older webinars um, and, and all the webinars that are done, even not just for me, for PMP Mag, um, they're up on YouTube, for goodness sakes. So YouTube videos from trusted sources, all right? I'm going to stress the trusted sources part, from universities, from product manufacturers and distributors. A lot of them produce videos. They might even be like directly on their websites, or they might just jump you over to YouTube. Um, and it's usually product specific, but hey, that's fine because if it's a product you use, who better to ask? You know, who better to go to for the video, the training video, than that manufacturer who makes the product? Industry experts, your magazines that you subscribe to probably have YouTube channels. So YouTube videos from trusted sources are important. Monthly hands-on. This is free. You can do this in your office parking lot. You can do this in your own front yard. If you're just starting out and you're working out of your garage, God bless you. You can do this in your own front yard. Monthly hands-on calibration and equipment training. That's free. All that it takes is setting up you know, the 30-minute training meeting at your office. Math. All right, I know everybody loves math. Um, if I could hear you, I would hear the collective laughter. I do like math, and I'm not talking, this isn't like calculus, just practical math skills. And reviewing them every couple of months or so is very important. And trust me, I, I review math all the time. And I get a lot of calls, a lot of questions, um, and every time you know, I'm dealing with rates or, or product applications. I'm, I'm definitely calling on math skills. That is, again, 
something free you can do in your office. Label reviews. Here we go, another freebie. Call your qualified distributor and manufacturer representatives who they should know their labels better than most. Invite them in. They can help guide you also where their products work best and where they, you know, where they don't. And a good representative is going to share with you, you know, my product is good for XYZ. It's not so good for, for these other things. So you might want to look at a different product. Um, and they'll also be able to update you on label changes. You know, labels change a lot, and no one's actually required to tell you when the labels change. It's actually the responsibility is with the applicator to know the label. You could also create a label quiz. Again, your only investment here is time. Quizzes don't have to be tough or boring. You can make fun, easy quizzes for any product label that you have. You could offer some small prizes. They, you know, they're also a fun idea if you're having quizzes. And here are some two really easy quizzes, a personal protective equipment, a PPE quiz, and a rate quiz. You can even have a safety quiz, for goodness sakes. Some more free stuff you can find online. Some distributors have websites, and if you're a customer, you can log in and print examples of contracts, free contracts, free inspection forms. This is a great place to start. Uh, again, I told you earlier I'm kind of old school. I like a good old binder with paper in it for my training manual because I like to flip the pages. Um, I, I don't mind it so much being digital, but I, I do like a good old binder. And so it's nice when you can go someplace and, and print off a free example of contracts or inspection forms. It's going to be very helpful when you build your own training manuals, and it saves time. You don't need to recreate the wheel. Oftentimes it's free if you are a customer of that distributor or that manufacturer. And there's even training videos on some of these distributor and manufacturer websites that are available to you free. Your state websites, I happen to be in the state of Florida, and so I have a Florida a WDO, a Wood Destroying Organisms Inspection Report form on the screen, but your state may also offer free forms for, the, for you to use. So again, why create the wheel? Now, depending on the state that you're in, some states might make it mandatory for you to use forms that they've already generated, and then other states might just give you you know, examples as a freebie um, for other categories or some, um, you know, just, just free examples of, of forms and inspection. One of my favorite places for free stuff, leading universities with strong entomology, agronomy, plant pathology programs, even business programs. All right, I know there's owners on here. I know there's managers on here. And we don't need to just talk about training technicians and training sales um, on the actual business of bugs. We also could all use business training. And so don't just think of, like I have up here, University of Florida, don't just think of them for um, the insect side of the business with featured creatures, but you could also just start trolling through university websites um, that have strong business schools. Because just like we have uh, great content for uh, the biology part of our, base, our business segment, there's also great content at the, the online uh, or the websites of the business schools for all of these large universities. So in the case of what I have on the screen for you guys, sometimes the graduate students have to produce online publications as part of their programs, which I did. It's, um, it's something I did, and some of my articles are still in Featured Creatures at UF. And you can have a tech pick a creature, if you will, and present it to your company once per month. So right then and there, Featured Creatures is really cool because somebody else has already dissected the information, boiled it down to one or two pages, and all you have to do is hit print and read it to your group, basically and you can each share in that responsibility. So that's a great resource. And I'm sure, obviously, there's a lot of people not in Florida on the call. 
your respective strong entomological uh, universities will have a similar feature. State and industry associations also offer lots of free stuff for their members. Contract examples, forms, graphing guides, training opportunities, discounts. Discounts are a little off topic, but hey, I like discounts. Um, depending on which state association you belong to, just your membership might give you something simple like five cents off every gallon of gas at a certain place. You never know. And there's probably some other perks of being a member of your state association. So you don't need to feel overwhelmed or alone. There are so many resources available to you in our industry. You can check with your publications, your subscriptions, the monthly magazines you subscribe to, check on magazine websites for training topics, and even in-depth articles on specific pests, and start building a resource library for yourself. They're all good training meeting topics, and they're all good to add to the SOPs and the training manual that you'll eventually develop or that you're freshening up. So looking at creating an organized program. Organized standard operating procedures um, it's usually good to base them on the category or area being treated. That will be helpful. So take general household pest control. If that's all you do, that's great. You then can break it down into smaller subcategories. So you would have a general standard operating procedure that deals with how you do GHP, or in some places we call it GPC. And then you could have a standard operating procedure that deals with just inspection. Inspection of kitchens or bathrooms or just general inspection indoors. Now we're talking about indoors. You could include conducive conditions to look for. You could include cultural techniques like sanitation, clutter control, food storage options for pets and for human food, and application techniques could be a separate SOP within your indoor pest control training binder. And those application techniques could include baiting, liquid sprays, dust, you name it. Whatever you do for your treatments and how you do your treatments, you would include that in your indoor pest control standard operating procedure or training manual. Here's an example of an inspection checklist. You would also print this out and add this to your training manual or your SOP for indoor GHP inspections. And you can either create an inspection checklist, very easy, you know, in, uh, in your computer, or you could probably find a free one through any of those free sources that we just went through a couple minutes ago. Visuals are really great to add. Visuals or pictures of how and where to inspect and treat are very helpful in a training manual. They help support the inspection and application checklist that you might put in your program. Let's take a look at a couple inspection and treatment photos for kitchens and interior pest control. This is also another way to get your techs involved and help you in the process. You know, a lot of people have smartphones, and a lot of technicians these days are now armed with smartphones and iPads. I mean, they're out there collecting payments on the iPad. They're signing, you know, homeowners are signing contracts right on an iPad. It's amazing. And so we have all these great cameras, like on almost all the technology we have. We might as well put these cameras to use. So this happens just to be a picture, you know, when they're inspecting. Here's how we pull out a drawer. We look behind it. Maybe that's where we might place a bait. Maybe that's where we might use an aerosol. You know, however you want to work the photos in, um, these are just some example photos. We'll take a look at this. This photo is dusting in a wall void after you took the, um, the switch plate cover off. Again, just an example of what you could add to your training manual during maybe the inspection or treatment part of your training manual. This one just happens to highlight entry points. So again, if you are 
making an inspection checklist or go a step, just going step by step through how you do an inspection or how you treat um, for your interior pest control, then you, know, you could incorporate photos like these. This is another one showing inspection. It happens to be an outdoor kitchen, so maybe not necessarily indoor pest control, but a uh, very similar scenario. So you can add these photographs, again, to your manual to help, to help whoever is learning, especially the new hires, to, it's kind of like putting a face to a name. It's easier to remember. Um, it's easier to put this picture to an activity. So now if we're going to jump from, we, we kind of mentioned what your indoor framework might look like for indoor GHP. Now we'll look at outdoor general pest control. Again, it's a lot of the same things. You would have an SOP for outdoor general pest control, which could, you could also call it exterior perimeter pest control, and you'd cover inspection techniques, what to look for, those conducive conditions, pests, the types of pests you might deal with in your region, clutter and how it you know, relates to the discussion with the homeowner, with cultural con control methods. You could have a list. Um, you could even include in your standard operating procedures, in your manuals, you could include a talking points list for um, discussion with a homeowner that might cover web removal or clutter control or redirection of a downspout to keep moisture away from the base of the foundation. You, again, would have a subsection on application techniques. Um, base it, of course, on the labels that you use. And remember, these are always, always living documents. They're always a work in progress, and they don't need to be perfect for you to roll them out to your team. But application techniques for outdoor might include power spraying, backpack, using a B&G, how you apply liquids, where you apply liquids, depending on what it is. You know, with the most recent pyrethroid restrictions, we've had a lot of changes there for applications outdoors. Um, and baits, you know, depending on what kind of bait it is, it's going to dictate how it's going to be uh, used outside. And then including maps. Maps and diagrams are awesome, especially for outdoor pest control um, SOPs, and it helps the techs know what goes where. Again, we're getting back to the how, what, when, where, and why. So we need to know what goes where and why. And it might cover the immediate surface of the structure or the immediate perimeter, and then it might get out into mulched beds or landscape perimeter and turf grass. And then, you know, consider some other structures on the property, like a pool or pump house um, and maybe some wood piles. And what that might look like, uh, thanks to my friends at Black Pest, they let me use this diagram. I think it's a fantastic diagram. And it kind of shows the, these three zones that they train on in their company. And a lot of us just get stuck on zone one, that immediate exterior perimeter, when we should also be training our technicians and our salespeople to pay attention to the outer zones, zone two, adjacent landscaping and ground areas. And zone three you know, might be wood piles and pool pump house, um, et cetera. So having a nice diagram as part of the training manual is very helpful when you're directing your new techs and even talking to your seasoned techs about where products are applied, how, and why. Visuals are awesome tools, and I can't stress that enough. And you can find a ton of visuals online. You know, it's all, almost all free. If you use something just for internal training purposes, usually you don't need to ask permission um, for that. If you do use it for profit, you need to ask permission if you use somebody else's content or visuals. So you do want to make sure that you know, you're not doing any sort of copyright infringement. Um, you can even make your own visuals if you would like. Um, take photos or if you want to draw them out yourselves, that's fine. These happen to be a couple of, of visuals off of Google um, images and I happen to, you know, they're just for termite inspection. So you could do the same type of SOP for your termite inspection um, and treatment uh, category. 
a few other exterior treatment diagrams you could throw in. This, these diagrams, act, actually, um, these came from my pyrethroid label changes webinar, which is up on YouTube through mypmp.net. And uh, again, I just highlighted areas of the structures where you could or could not treat. Um, and again, if you could always follow up and watch that uh, webinar at your leisure um, and understand how I use them. But this is just a good example to show you could just draw. You don't even have to get fancy with the computer. You could just use a highlighter and take a picture of a house and then highlight the areas where you apply certain products. It can be that simple. Here's some examples for math training visual aids. Um, it can be as simple as area is A times B, like you see in the upper right-hand corner. And then you could also you know, get a little fancier. And the image in the lower left section is about calculating area for termite treatment applications. So you could put some measurements um, to those sides of those spaces and then ask your, your termite crew to kind of go through. You could walk through um, how you would calculate it. And that's another tip, especially when you're dealing with math. It's not everybody's favorite subject. And it's a good idea if you are going to tackle just kind of refreshing how we calculate, how we use math and we calculate rates and we calculate area. It's best not to put people on the spot. It's better to basically go through it step by step with the whole group um, and not put pressure on people, especially in the realm of math. I've learned that and it's uh, everybody learns better when they feel supported and not picked on. And so when you're dealing with math, it's good just to walk step by step through it and then ask questions during the process as you're working the math and invite people uh, to, you know, to ask questions at that point rather than just handing a math problem out and say, solve this and then see who solves it because that, uh, you never want to embarrass anybody. Um, you want to simply help them and bring them along and, uh, you know, help them understand math. Math is not scary. So now we're going to talk about, and this actually, this section, um, is really related to the questions that came in. So now we're getting into some questions that came in during registration. And then after this, hopefully we'll have some time for live questions. Now, if we don't, again, I apologize because I love training and so I, I talk a lot about it. Um, my email address will be at the end and it's all over the pmp.net, uh, mypmp.net website. So um, you can always contact me directly. But these are a lot of the discussion uh, points that came in during registration, and I, th I thought they were important. So um, we want to talk about customer retention as it relates to technician and sales staff personalities. Follow through as a company, follow through as a manager, follow through as a technician, as a salesperson, and, and also attitudes in general. So. This section is really a deviation from training, but it's going to help support your training. So personalities in general. We all have some really distinct personalities. Some of us are naturally social, and we strike up conversations easily with just about anyone. I mean, I do it. I talk to a wall if it would talk back. Others might be a little less outgoing. And that's totally fine. Both types of personality, um, that's, they're fine in our industry. What we need to recognize, however, is that we are in a service business. And that means that we have customers, A, that we need to talk to, and B, some customers require a face-to-face -face contact or a discussion, or at the very least, um, a personal or non-digital contact. So some of them might not do email. Some of them might prefer a phone call. Some of them might want to talk to the tech when he or she is at the property. And all sales staff, CSRs and techs, really do need to be willing to talk with their customers, even if it might be sometimes out of their comfort zone. So this is 
something I've seen over the years. I call it the sales versus technicians rut. Over the years, I've noticed a pattern across companies of all sizes. Believe me, it's, uh, it doesn't escape anyone. It boils down to sales versus technicians. This can take a number of forms, um, but for today, we're going to address this part of it. Sales, it's, it's been believed that sales does the talking, technicians do the treating. And this idea could not be further from the truth. In my opinion, technicians are your brand ambassadors for your company long after the sale has closed. They will have the most opportunities for contact with your customers, and that makes it exceptionally important for them to represent your company well. Sometimes that just means taking five minutes to chat with a homeowner before they race on to the next account. Now, I know that technicians are charged with some high production numbers, and I know that, um, you know, I hear from a lot of them they want to end their day early or they want to end their day by a certain time, and talking to customers might, you know, get them into an office, back to the office an hour later than they, they wanted to. But the big deal is taking that five minutes and talking to a homeowner that wants to talk to you or has a simple question can mean the difference between retaining that customer and a cancellation. And it's a lot harder to get a new customer to replace that one that you already have. So talking to them really does strengthen a relationship. And you need that relationship to be built between your technicians um, and the customers they treat. So moving on to follow through. It's not just for the sales team. Now speaking from 13 years of sales experience, follow through can make or break a salesperson. Let me tell you, it is life and death. So uh, it is very important for all groups in the company to respect and honor follow through and keep their promises, but it's, it's, very, uh, it's also very important for the text. So if a homeowner or a customer has a question and we don't have the answer, let the, let the homeowner know we might not know at this time. I don't know, but I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to get back to you uh, with the answer and make sure that everybody understands that this is an important exercise and it's not just an exercise it's really a way of life in business and it's great to tell it's very important to tell a homeowner or whoever's asking the question tell them when to expect an answer and then stick with that promise so if you tell them i'm going to find out and i'm going to let you know by next friday you better let them know by next friday our customers simply want to be treated how we want to be treated and it's not difficult, but sometimes we let schedules and stress and fear get in our way of providing excellent service, and we shouldn't. We just really shouldn't. Lastly, attitude. We need to be aware that individual attitudes can make or break a salesperson's, a technician's, a CSR's, a manager's, or even an owner's career. Treat others as you want to be treated and say thank you. Again, it is not rocket science, and you might, you know, think I'm nuts for going off uh, in this direction today, which is totally fine. I respect that. I'm a little crazy at times. But saying thank you is so important. Um, and, you know, I haven't done it in a while, but um, back when I was doing a lot of purely sales, I actually would send out these surveys to my customers around the state of Florida, and I would ask them, how am I doing, and um, what can I do better, and what do I do that you like? And I would get these responses, and overwhelmingly, um, customers who had been my customers for so long, for, for a great part of my career in, in sales, said they were there and they stayed with me because I said thank you that they just want to hear thank you. And I found that, to me, that's profound. Do we thank our customers enough? So taking time to talk to them, to listen to them, following through and keeping a promise, and saying thank you are amazing, simple things you can do to retain your customers. And also understand that no one is perfect. 
when you treat your customers with respect and follow through, they're going to do the same thing for you, which basically equals customer retention. Now we're going to take some questions, I believe. Is that right, Will? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, two here that I can kind of combine into one. It touches a little bit on something you were talking about earlier. How do you get your technicians involved with social media, getting them to post videos? Um, and also, where can you find fresh training content for your technicians that's not necessarily product related? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Okay. First, before I get into the questions, I want to thank everybody because sometimes we lose people at this point on the webinar. And so I want to say thank you to everybody who has been on the call today. And please stay on because I am going to have a pretty good answer for this one. Um, at least I think so. But thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to be with us today. And for this question, so how do you get them involved in social media, or at least gathering up the content? Again, I mentioned a couple times throughout the presentation about we have smartphones. It's some, it can be something as simple as um, snapping a photo of a pest problem at a customer's house. It could, be, it could be snapping a photo of a pest on a plant if you do lawn and ornamental work. And making sure that whomever in the office or the company deals with social media or marketing or maybe handling the website, make sure that they give that information, that photograph to the right person. Now, how do you encourage this? Well, you could, again, I love you know inexpensive little prizes. You could have a monthly contest for the best bug photo from your technician. And I guarantee you that they will be ready to download those photos for you at the end of every month. And you'll be able to sift through them and see you know, what's been going on and, and pick the best one and award a prize for it. So incentivizing people really does work. It doesn't have to be a big and fancy, um, a big and fancy prize. It can be something quite simple. And uh, that's one way to get them involved. So how about the, the rest of your question, Will, so, is so how to get them involved in social media and creating content. Oh, creating content. Um, now, sometimes you've got to get permission to link back and forth between different websites, but how we mentioned um, each technician or salesperson delivering a pest topic um, at each meeting, the information that they deliver could then be used as content for a blog post or for a website post or even for a featured pest, if you have a featured pest on your website. Or if you have technicians that maybe you keep getting continual calls about one specific pest and it happens to be that time of year, then that's a great time to tweet and post on Facebook. Use social media to alert your customers about um, the current pest of the moment, the pest of the season, or let's get ready to winterize your lawn before the winter comes. Um, or if you're dealing in termites, um, you could be tweeting about what species of termite is swarming when. Uh, I happen to be you know, in a hotbed of a multiple species of termites. Um, so that can provide a lot of posts throughout the year. So it's it's really about incentivizing your uh, staff and your technicians and your salespeople to help contribute the content and making it fun. So if you give them a reason to do it, they will do it. Now the second part was, uh, I think, Will, you mentioned fresh content that's not necessarily product related, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. So fresh content that's not necessarily product related. Um, I would go to your local extension offices, to the websites. Um, I mean, go Gators. So I'm going to give a little Gator shout out. But the University of Florida has uh, fabulous information at their extension offices um, as well as online. So again, you could. You might need to get permission to link to certain things, but as an I'll just use the featured creatures again as an example. 
Um, it has nothing to do with product, but say right now is, you know, a big time for a certain pest on, um, I'm not sure, crepe myrtle trees. Let's just make that one up. Well, you could research it just a little bit um, and maybe come across some information and then link to that information with your website. You could do pest alerts, um, monthly pest alerts or once a quarter pest alerts. And you could use social media, which is free, to get the word out and link it to a brief you know, blog post about it. So not all the information out there has to be related to product. Um, it's great to go outside of that box and think about the time of year it is, when you uh, might be encountering certain pests. And it might even be good um, to make a little kind of chart you know, to say in the spring, where I am in the Northeast, these are the problems we deal with. And in the um, summer in the Northeast, these are the problems we deal with for pest problems, for rodent problems, for lawn problems, and then just go down by the season, fall and then winter, and keep a little running chart of what seems to be the pest of the moment for those seasons. And then you could find a little bit of information and put a little pest alert out right before that season starts. And that way it doesn't have to be all product related. Hopefully right. that answered it. Was that kind of out there? Yeah, I would, I would <laughs> say that that was a very thorough answer. Um, we had uh, one or two more questions come in, so we'll let you, uh, we'll, we'll pass those along to you, and you can answer those directly to those folks. Um, we're going to wrap oh, it up for now. We want to thank Marie once again for another spectacular webinar. Um, and right now I'm going to turn it back over to Diane, and she can tell you uh, some other things that are coming up for us. Thank you for attending the Technician Training Basics for Better Business Habits webinar. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the mypmp.net website and will be emailed to you one day from today. Please visit the Pest Management Professional website for information about our upcoming webinar, Tap into the Growing Insulation Market, which will take place October 2nd. Thank you for attending, and have a nice afternoon.